in this portion of scripture, red letter in my Bible, it said, he answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. In other words, he was describing himself, Brother Figaro. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that soweth them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Whew, boy, this is heavy, isn't it? Now, we, we started off just apocalyptic here. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels. And they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as a sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And in other words, he was saying, now hear this. Or to everybody that's here, pay attention to the next statement. There's a, a few phrases here in the, in the scriptures that, that are ahead where we've seen this very grim picture from the first few scriptures. Now the Lord is going to give us the antidote whereby that we don't have to suffer among the tares, okay? It's verse 44, please. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth. And for joy thereof goeth and shoveth all that he hath and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. Who when he hath found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind which when it was full, then drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. There that is again. Jesus said unto them, have you understood all these things and they say unto him, Yea, Lord. He was trying to convey to his followers a very sobering message about the end of days, about the fragility of life, about how important it is to make right choices. And tonight I want to talk to us just upon something very simple, but I think it's it's most needful in this hour, the power of choice. The power of choice. It's obvious to everyone here that if you're here tonight, you made a choice to be here. Thank God that you did. I'm so thankful that you are here. I'm so thankful that there are some who are incredibly faithful, some who will not miss, and some who have made up their mind and have a backbone and, and spiritual resolve to say, you know what, I, I need to be in the presence of God. I need to be among God's people. I need to be edified by the word of God. I need the word of the Lord, which is uh, symbolic of that water from heaven poured upon the parched and empty soul of my spirit. I need to be among strong people of God. I need to be in an atmosphere of prayer. I need to be in an atmosphere of praise and worship. I need to be in an atmosphere that edifies the body, not only the body of Christ, but my personal body in return. Can somebody say amen? We have the power of choice. Now everybody likes to feel powerful from time to time. Amen? The power to make decisions. The power to do what you want to do when you want to do it. There are those tonight, case in point, who have exercised their power of choice. They are not here. But they will miss the thing that God has designed for them by a million miles because they chose not to be here. But there are those who made a cognizant 
reserved for the master's use. But then there would be those that would be called out. I don't want to be a tear. I don't want to be among the cubs. I don't want to be a bad fish, can somebody say amen? I want to be a good fish. I want to make heaven. I don't care anything about weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. I don't want to experience any part of it. I don't want to go to the furnace. I don't want to be like a tear. I don't want to be separated and the good people go one way and the bad people go the other. I can't hardly believe that the, bad, that the Bible even said that there are going to be good people and bad people. But Brother Figueroa, it does. We want to be so astute in this hour and this day that everybody's right in their own eyes. But the Bible said that in the last days there will be men that are proud, boastful, covetous, and men who would do what was right in their own eyes. Be careful. What the Bible said, because that'll be the beginning of the end. Does anybody here ever need any direction? I need direction. Now, the reason we all carry a little device in our pocket and refer to it from time to time, day after day, is because that device has become smarter than we are. I promise you this. Google knows a whole lot more than I do. And I want to bring you into divine revelation tonight. Google knows a whole lot more than you do. And whether you call it Google or whether you've affectionately named it Siri or whether you've named it anything else, there is, there is something, there's a higher entity, a power that is not even of God that knows more than we do. Jesus said, let him that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. The last time I checked, we are not an earless generation. We have not evolved so fast and so far to become some uh, prodigy of, of, of alien technology to where we sense or have sensory perception through the pores of our skin. We still have these two holes on our head and these weird little things that look like funnels. Some of them are larger than others. Some of, our, of ours are camouflaged by beautiful hair. Some of us who have no hair are just out of love. <laughs> These funnels on the side of our head are referred to as ears. And they funnel information into this thing that we are supposed to have called a brain. Amen? And Jesus said, to those of you that still have your ears, I want you to hear me. We've gone now, John, 2,000 years, point the past the time of, of the ministry of Jesus Christ, and we still have ears. So I think it's still relevant for us today to listen and hearken to the voice of God in the Scripture. Yeah. <clears throat> Look at your neighbor and say, you got your ears on? Your ears on. That's what we used to say years ago. It used to be a, a whole different language. It was radio language back in the 70s. Where people would talk on shortwave radios would ask do you have your ears on that means can you hear me the first few scriptures are apocalyptic at best the Lord talking about a great harvest of souls good and bad and the angels would go down and God makes good souls and the enemy sends forth evil seed Who? I, I, I just wanted to kind of skip over all that I, I, I don't want to be a bad seed I, I don't want to be among those whom the Lord comes and I'm not ready. You know, we don't even talk about being ready to meet God anymore. We really don't. We don't really talk about accountability to the Spirit of God anymore. It's an archaic idea in most churches. Most churches don't want to hear it. First time visitors and guests, if they come in and hear a message about heaven or hell, well, they're in their car so fast that you can't hardly get any information on them before they leave. But you know what? There is a reality to every aspect of what is mentioned right here in the book of Matthew. There's good seed and bad seed, and the Lord sowed the good seed, and the enemy sowed the bad seed. We're either among the good or the bad. There is no third party. And that which makes us good and that which makes us evil is pressed within the power of choice. You know, I have the power to be good. And for me, it's a full-time job. 
obvious and noted. That's why your ministry, when it goes forth, there's anointing, there's power, there's dominion, there's authority in it. I've got the power. Let me tell you something. Powerful or powerless is a choice.
engaged in a game. This is not like a video game. You know what? When we play, when, when, when we're in this, in this battle or this struggle of life that we're in, it's not like something that flips up on a movie screen. And when, when you play until that character dies, when that character dies, it says game over. And you push reset and you get another chance. That ain't what this is about, honey. You only get one shot. You only get one chance. You only get one chance to be a good husband, Justin. You only get one chance to be a good father. You get only one chance to be a man of your word and to be a minister. You only get one chance. You'll get seven, eight, ten chances. Let me tell you something. The power of your name and having a good name is to be well sought after and to be greater than the price of rubies and diamonds. But I will tell you this. You only get one shot at developing a good name. I know it seems like I'm frantic here tonight, but I'm here to tell you what, the church has got to rise up with strength. The church has got to rise up with some power. If you don't feel like it, you better act like it. I said, if you've got to act by faith, the Bible said, you have faith that's a grain of mustard seed. You start speaking to mountains, if you start acting like the mountain will move. Trodden down, beat up, cast down, obliterated every day. Who would 
county surrounding us so that we can rent our jail cells to the surrounding counties around us. We're making more money on criminals than Dallas County and Tarrant County combined. We just decided, hey, we got enough room over here. We'll build enough jail cells that we can rent to Dallas County and rent to Tarrant County jail cells for their prisoners to come up here and live in our county. If you don't believe that, check me out. We just nothing but a, a big criminal hotel system in our county. A place where people make cognizant choices to make bad choices, bad decisions. I tell you what, five minutes at the foot of the cross can eclipse a lifetime of poor choices. I think Joshua said it best, but he said, but as for me and my house, we will serve. know that when you draw the line that means this is it this is where we stand I've been talking a lot about it lately but I'm seeing us I'm seeing the modern church slip further and further from the harbor of truth listen to pastor here for a minute you know what if this generation right here doesn't hold the line what will this church like look like in the next 20 years what will this church believe in the next 20 years? Will we even have a message? Will we even preach the message? I'll tell you what, I want to get stronger, not weaker in God. I want to believe it more than I have ever believed it. I want to love people more than I've ever loved them. And I want them to know that I'm not willing that any should perish just like Jesus said. He wasn't either. But all should come to repentance. We will continue. This is a little APB that I want the faithful here to share with the church. We will continue to preach the truth. We will con continue to walk upright before the Lord. We will continue to preach this right here and nothing else. We're going to preach the word of God. We're going to live it. We're going to walk it. We're going to draw a line just this side of everything that everybody else is, is trying to straddle the line or straddle the fence. No, you know what? I'd rather us be safe than sorry. church safe and sorry. Because there are ministries and there are churches and there are pastors today that have that have sown to the wind and the Bible says when you sow to the wind honey, you will reap the whirlwind. Now we need to we need to understand the faithful you understand already. I'm just preaching to the choir tonight. But we have the power of choice. The power of choice. My God will your son or your daughter make heaven? I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that I know where their daddy stands. Mama's going to do everything she can to make sure that they know where mama stands. You know what? I'm not going to apologize for it. I ain't sorry for it. I'm going to try to line up the best I can to this right here. And, and you know what? They, they, the Bible doesn't say that, that your children are going to follow you every day that you live. The Bible says train up a child in the way that they should go. And then it goes, there's a gap there. It says, and when they are old. How many kids have any sense at all until they get older? Come on. You was a kid. You were stupid one time just like me. Huh? Did you ever do anything stupid when you were a kid? Lisa, both hands, please. Thank you.
everybody at the church. <laughs> Webster defines procrastination as this. To put off to another time. To put off to another time. When I was young, most everything got put off to another time. Mm -hmm. The older I got, Chris, I understood that there's just some things you can't put off. Some things you need to do. Especially if you're married and you want to continue being married. <laughs> uh, yes, I don't mean nothing about Chris, but that was about me. We grow up saying... Well, if so and so, so does it, I'll do it. Y'all ever been up, up to, the, to the, the, the swimming pool, had the big dive and the little dive, and you've been diving off the little dive for a long time, and, and, and everybody's coaching you, you know, you need to go on up that big diving board and, and jump off on that. And how many of you have felt just like I did and said, well, when so and so does it, I'll do it. Has anybody ever kind of had that same thought process? You know, if anyone else does, you know, I got the Holy Ghost that way. I was in an old-fashioned church service where, you know, they preached about 15, 20 minutes. And they preached hell so hot your toenails were melted. I stood on the back of the pew and I gripped the seat so tight I left, left claw marks in the back of that pew. And I can take you to that church right now. The pews are still exactly where they were, you know, years ago, nearly 40 years ago. Now... 40 something years ago 44 years ago I could take you to that pew and show you those claw marks they're still there but I said that night when God gripped my heart I said my cousin we're best, we're best buddies we chewed together we dipped together we smoked together we drank our first beer together we did all that you're looking up here like I ain't Superman I'm just a man and I, I never told him this but I thank God he went to the altar that night we're sitting there like wooden Indians not just a crying and a crying I'm 14 years old I wouldn't open my mouth. I wouldn't look. My cousin was Ricky Treese is up preaching. He's 13 years old, a little younger than me at the time, I think. That real horrible thing, you better shut the door right now, be right now. He just like lightning. Oh! I so grieved because I knew that I wasn't doing right. I knew I needed to make the right choice. Everything in me knew that what was right, but nothing in me wanted to do it. And I was sitting there in my flesh, dying with everything I had. And I finally decided, okay, God, I'll make a deal with you. If my cousin goes down to the front and pray, then I'll go down and pray. Now, you say, well, well, that's stupid. Yes, you're right. That's stupid. I told you did a lot of stupid things when I was a kid. Remember? Yeah. Well, that was stupid. Well, I was faced with this decision, Casey, that just minutes later, not even a whole minute, but seemed like an hour, my cousin broke free and ran down to the altar and cried like a little girl.
today isn't like a place with fire. That's just figuratively speaking. Hell is a place where you just undergo an IRS audit or something. And you don't have any paperwork. You know what I'm saying? We've kind of reduced hell to that. I don't know why I'm looking at this. I'm not even talking about that. So, 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 now it's either put up or shut up. Instantly, I quit crying, dried up instantly, and, and without ever saying a word, I thought to myself, what are you doing? <laughs> Holy smoke. I just made a deal. I just told the Lord, I said, okay, now, Lord, if he goes, I'll go. And then the idiot gets up and goes down. <laughs> and I'm like, but then... them healed and restored. If you, if, if you knew you had that, would you be willing to help that person who needs that healing? Certainly, of course. Absolutely. If you knew a person here was struggling with some
step out. Rejoice in that thing that you have already overcome. Rejoice in that thing that you have already conquered. Rejoice in the knowledge that you are healed. You're blessed. You have overcome many things. And just step out. Because I want you to know, just like I'm here tonight teaching this lesson tonight because I had a friend or a family member who one day just stepped out on what they knew was right. He reacted to his power of choice. And what did his power of choice do for me? It automatically started a chain reaction and it affected my decision to do what was right. Amen. <clears throat> the only thing Jesus said that you and I would do and the only thing that we are called to do is to be a witness. And he said, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. In Jerusalem, Denton, Judea, Denton County, Samaria, state of Texas, uttermost parts of the world, the United States and beyond. That's I'm trying to tell you that's kind of what he was saying. You shall be witnesses unto me. So let me tell you something. In every service, Casey, you don't even know it, man, but you are a great inspiration. You play with every ounce of your fiber. You put every inch of your heart into it. And people leave here every service inspired because they say, man, if he can do that. If he can do that. If that guy who looks like he's got it all together is probably one of the most handsome, talented, cool guys in the world can do all of that. Maybe there's hope for me. You understand? You don't have to have a Bible study. You don't have to do anything great. Just be what you already are and respond and act with what you already have. Step out with what you already know is right. And then there, there are times, Sister Arbor, we can just pray and, and, and stand in, in for other people. And, and we, we're, the, we're the core group here tonight, so we stand in faithfulness for those who have yet to be faithful. And we say, okay, God, lay it on my heart. Lord, I know they're wrestling with this, or I know they're wrestling with that. I know they need to overcome this. God, give me a word. By your word, not just my word, but by your word. Give me a scripture. Give me something, Lord, that I can go and I can give it to them and empower them. We either choose to be powerful or we choose to be powerless. We either come to church every service with this Groundhog Day idea of starting over every service. Starting our relationship with God over every service. Okay? And trying to build back up to where we just have enough strength to walk out to the car and, and possibly crawl back in here on our hands and knees on Sunday afternoon at 2. Or we come in here and we're not powerful, but we start acting powerful. Right. I'm going to tell you, if a bad guy comes over to my house and, 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 and knocks my door down and I don't meet him at the door or I don't detain him or I don't fight back, He'll walk right through my house and take everything I want or everything he wants, rather. The Bible says that there's a thief coming to every house. But if the good man of the house knew what hour the thief would have come, he would have not allowed his house to be broken up. So I want you to know I might not be the strongest. I might not have the power that week or, that, or, or at that moment. But I will tell you this. He will think I'm very powerful if he comes to my house. He will not encounter a floor rug that he can step on and walk across me to get to my family. Right. Even if I don't feel real spiritually strong at the moment or at the time, I will act by faith. Right. I will start acting on what I already know and the knowledge I already have. And if he's going to come in and, 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 and tear up my house, he'll have to do it. But he'll have to get through me to do it. You know what? There are many people who need salvation Many people who need a change. Many people who need to come to God. And you know what? They're counting on you and I, those who are faithful, the core group of this church tonight, to remain faithful, to be strong, to be a witness, to step out, to pray for others, to come down. We should never have to ask more than one time if there's a need or would you come and pray.
Man, I'll tell you, this group right here, you ought to be the first people out. And you know what? The best thing we could do, and I know this is going to take you out of your comfort zone, but you're the faithful. You can handle it. When it's time to come down and pray, you need to just walk over and get somebody by the hand that you've been praying for already or you're sensitive about already and walk down here with them. They're waiting on you to do that. You would not believe how many people come to church and say, if someone would just come to me with a word, if someone would just come to me and and tell me they love me, if someone would just come and get me by the hand and take me to this altar, I can't stand on my own. I'm not strong enough on my own. If somebody would just take me by the hand, I think I would have the strength to go if they would help me. Amen. I don't know why I found it so passionate today. Please don't be upset with me. Please. Just understand I knew I could trust you with this. I knew I could trust you with this. God brought exactly who needed to be in this service tonight. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We already have, we already made recipients. We already have, 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 have been recipients of the sincere milk of the word. Now it's time to have the meat. Mm-hmm. And you know what? If we're not strong enough, we start acting like we are anyway. That's what was called the Acts of the Apostles. Would you stand with me? Church, I love you. I love this church. I love all our people. I don't want to be all heavy and boo-hoo and all that. We as Pentecostals know what the treasure is. We've already found it. We know exactly how to obtain the treasure. And we know exactly what the treasure will cost. Sister Jillian, we discussed it earlier this week. Jesus said the first and great commandment is thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second is like as unto it that we love our neighbor ourself. He said upon these two commandments rest all the law and the prophets. I preached tonight till I'm wore out. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Probably need to sit down somewhere. I'm going to start going to the gym and y'all won't even recognize me before long. I'm going to come in here and you're going to wonder who kidnapped Brother Hudson. Now, for those of you who don't believe that, I want you to start acting like you believe that. I need a little encouragement. Many procrastinate. Many fail to respond spontaneously. Many fail to obtain. Making all sorts of things that are immaterial a stumbling block. Never selling out. But young... You know what? I believe heaven's going to be worth whatever we have to give to make heaven. Amen. (laughs) I think it's going to be worth whatever it takes. Whatever I might have to relinquish or lay aside. The Bible asks me about it. Jesus said, lay aside every weight and sin. So let us lay aside every weight. The Bible said they sold all they had, not a portion, not a percentage, not a part, but all. Wow. That's a tall order, isn't it? Lord, it's hard for people to give part of anything they have today to God, let alone try to preach a gospel that requires all. I know this. Not everybody will give all. But those who do will be mighty. They will be blessed. They will be anointed. They will not have to act powerful. They will be powerful. I said, when you're willing to give it all. The Lord required Isaac of Abraham. And to Abraham it was his all. The Lord asked him for it. 
Abraham took the boy to the top of the mountain. You know the story. We've talked about it many times. Tied him down on the altar, raised his hand with a knife to punch it into the heart of his son. Take the very thing that meant everything to him. The angel of the Lord had to call his name twice. Abraham. Abraham stopped his hand as it was going down. There was a ram caught in the thicket. And that which had been required of Abraham or had been asked of him was not then required. But God saw his heart and knew he was willing to give it. Would you close your eyes with me just a second? I'm just going to ask for a little spiritual inventory. Are you willing to give God whatever it takes to be among the wheat and not the tares, to be a good seed, not harvested with a bad seed? Are you willing? You know, only you can decide, but I have empowered you tonight with a simple message on the power of choice. I just want to do the right thing. I can no longer do what is right in my own eyes, but I've got to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. The Bible says there's a way that seemeth right to a man that the end thereof is death. Doesn't matter what you and I think so much about the affairs of this world, it's what does God think about it and how does it fit into his plan. It's a sobering thought among the faithful tonight. I'm not asking you to come and weep and cry at this altar. I'm just asking you to take inventory of your own soul and say, if I knew that I could help somebody in every service, would I be willing to step out? Would I be willing to help? Would I be willing to say a word? Would I be willing to pray? Would I be willing to go down if someone would follow me? I think everybody in here would do it. I really believe they would. Lord Jesus, you see every heart every life under the sound of my voice. You understand our need before we ask. And you understand the Lord is waiting upon those who are not strong to become strong. He's waiting on those who say, I, I, I just, I don't know what to do, but if there ever was a scripture that sums up acting strong, the Bible says, let the weak say, I am strong. That's a scripture of what I would like for you to remember tonight. Let the weak say, I am strong. It's in our weakness that he is strong tonight. Would you just simply give him that tonight as they sing for just a moment? I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus.